everybody, Dr. O. Um, this is the neural tissue review. So there's a lot of terminology here because we're basically mapping out the entire nervous system, which will then be covered later in, in later chapters. So let's just go ahead and dive right in, though. First is the first way to classify parts of the nervous system is central versus peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system, everything else. So just remember that. If it's, the, if it's the brain or spinal cord we're talking about, it's your central nervous system or your CNS. Everything else is part of your peripheral nervous system or PNS. Afferent versus efferent. So afferent means towards, efferent means away, right? How I, how I talked about this in my medical terminology videos is if something, you know, things that are done to, to you kind of have an affect on you, effects are what you're doing. So uh, just remember that the afferent nerves are traveling towards your brain, efferent nerves are traveling away. So hopefully that helps you remember what they do. Your sensations, what you feel is traveling towards your brain, so your brain can do something with the information. Your e so your afferent nerves are your sensory nerves, your efferent nerves are your motor nerves. What are you actually doing with that information? So you have to tell your hand what to do from the brain to the hand to do something, right? So your motor nerves are efferent part of the efferent division. Your sensory nerves are part of the afferent division. My hand, my fingers telling me what, I've, what I'm feeling, that kind of thing. So that's afferent versus efferent division. Next, we have somatic versus autonomic nervous system. So somatic means body. So think, so think muscle, think skeletal muscle, you know, controlling joints, that kind of stuff. So your somatic nervous system is, is the control of your skeletal muscle, both voluntary and involuntary. So reflexes would be involuntary control of those muscles. Autonomic, when I think of autonomic, I think of like automatic or subconscious. So it's the autonomic nervous system controls everything else, your, your, or which, we'll, which we'll get to in a list here in a little bit. But uh, um, So you have skeletal muscles controlled by somatic nervous system. I'll say it here now too. So cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, and fat are controlled by your autonomic nervous system. So you can't consciously tell your body to get rid of fat. I wish you could. But uh, so that's somatic versus autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system, you've probably heard of the fight or flight system. So your sympathetic division is actually your fight, flight, or freeze system. And it's very excitatory. It's all about mobilizing energy, preparing for physical activity. That's one of the biggest issues with stress is that um, your body, you, you can have all sorts of stress. You can have chemical, mental, emotional stress. Uh, but the problem is your body deals with it all the same way. It, 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 it deals with it preparing for physical activity. So you can't, you can't run away from a test. You can't punch your mortgage, right? But uh, um, that's just the system we have. So your sympathetic system, think, think excitatory, all about mobilizing energy. Parasympathetic would be called the rest and digest system. Some call it the rest and repose system. So it's going to be more inhibitory, more about regeneration. So I think sympathetic, think excitatory, preparing for physical action, fight, flight, freeze. Parasympathetic is all about resting, digesting, regenerating the body. So hopefully we have a balance between those two, kind of that yin-yan. But uh, if not, we start to see problems. So that's your sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system. So we'll go into much more detail about that at the time when we need to. Cranial versus spinal nerves. So your nerves, if they're attached to the brain, they're cranial nerves, and we have 12 pairs of them. If they're attached to the spinal cord, we have 31 spinal segments, they're going to be spinal nerves. So that just tells you where, where to find these nerves. Okay, what part of your nervous system controls skeletal muscle? I've already mentioned that. That's going to be your somatic nervous system is what controls skeletal muscle. Uh, what are the four areas controlled by the autonomic nervous system? I already said that as well. Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, and fat. So you have your, your autonomic nervous system is automatically or subconsciously controlling things like hormone secretions. Like you, don't, you don't have to tell your pancreas to squeeze and contract and um, secrete digestive enzymes when you eat. Um, we, don't, we don't tell our heart to beat faster or slower or beat at all. Um, we don't tell our smooth muscle what to do either. So th those are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. What kind of neurons are multipolar, unipolar, and bipolar? So we'll just look at like the, the real major examples. Multipolar neurons think motor nerves. Unipolar neurons think sensory nerves. And bipolar neurons think special sense nerves. So like in your eyes, for example. Uh, let's see. What kinds of chemicals send nervous signals across synapses? Those would be your neurotransmitters. So we'll learn later that if a chemical messenger that's dumped into your blood or your body fluids is called a hormone. If it's dumped into a synapse, it is called a neurotransmitter. How many motor nerves, sensory nerves, sorry, my nose is itching. Um, how many motor nerves, sensory nerves, and interneurons are there? So 
For your motor nerves, you have about 500,000, about half a million of them. Your sensory neurons, there are about 10 million of them. And interneurons, which are like association neurons, they help with um, coordination and planning, that kind of stuff. There are 20 billion with a B of those. So 10 million sensory nerves, 500,000 motor nerves, 20 billion interneurons. So interneurons are what allow us to ha have really complex responses to things. So like, you know, there are, there are real simple reflexes and real si simple instinctual things that can occur. But the complexity of a, of a nervous system like ours comes from these interneurons. Okay, know the key facts for each of the six neuroglial cells. So oh, give, give me just one second. Okay, sorry about that. So neuroglia means nerve glue. These are, or some people just call them glial cells. These are not your neurons. These are going to be the support cells around them. So there are six different types. You'll find four different types of neuroglia in your central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and two out in the peripheral nervous system. So um, first one, let's start with the astrocytes. They, ha they have a lot of functions. Astrocytes play a major role in, in the scaffolding or structure of your central nervous system. They play a role in the blood-brain barrier, which is, a, which is a biochemical barrier that helps keep the brain isolated from the rest of the body in many ways. Um, on kind of a new thing there is something that I talk about more now than I used to is the fact that one of the main functions of the astrocytes is to take glucose and convert it to lactate. And lactate is a phenomenal fuel source for your neurons. So uh, people have heard of like ketones being used for fuel. Ketones and lactate are used. There's the same, it's called an MCT transporter. Same transporter can transport and utilize those fuel sources. It's really cool. So astrocytes, they really are, I mean, they're, so think 3D structure of the brain. They help, they help to feed the neurons as well as, as playing role with the blood-brain barrier. Um, next, we have ependymal cells. So ependymal cells think everything about cerebral spinal fluid. They, they make, it's called the choroid plexus, is ependymal cells plus blood supply. They make cerebral spinal fluid, they help circulate it through, through your central nervous system, and they also recycle it. So ependymal cells just think everything about CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the oligodendrocytes, so those are going to be the cells they myelinate the cells, the neurons of your central nervous system. So myelin is a fatty insulation that covers your nerves and decreases resistance. So the nerves work way better when they're myelinated. So the cells, the, a good example of that, if you want to know when it stops working, think about MS. So multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease that affects the myelin sheath. So the nerves, um, the nerves are fine. They're, the insulation around them is where the problem is. And then you see all the issues that come with that. Another good example would be babies. Like babies have nerves and they have muscles. Like why can't they control these things? Well, basically these nerves need to be myelinated over time. So that's why you have these developmental milestones. Babies are learning how to do things as their nerves are, are ready, basically. So excuse me. So that's going to be your oligodendrocytes. And the last one here for the central nervous system is your microglia. So microglia, I basically, I basically think of them as the immune system of the, of the central nervous system. So they help clean up uh, tissue. They can help fight off pathogens, et cetera. So that's, those are the four neuroglial cells of the CNS. The peripheral nervous system, we have satellite cells and Schwann cells. So satellite cells, their key is they control the environment the peripheral nerves are in whether it has to do with things like oxygen and carbon dioxide or nutrients. And then your, uh, your Schwann cells, they myelinate peripheral nerves the way oligodendrocytes myelinate central nervous system nerves. So that's the key facts for each of the six neuroglial cells. Now we're talking about action potential. And of clearly, this is just a review. These things are covered in much more detail in all the other resources that I've shared with you. What is the resting membrane potential voltage and what pump maintains that voltage? So the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. And then when you, when you depolarize a nerve, it, go, it jumps up to positive 30 millivolts. When, then when you hyperpolarize it, it, it jump, jumps down to like a negative 100. And then it goes back to negative 70 where it's now at its resting potential. So think of it being uh, negative 70 millivolts is potential energy. It's a loaded gun. You have, to, you have to pull the trigger. So what pump maintains that voltage? That's the sodium potassium exchange pump, a textbook example in every anatomy textbook I've ever seen of an active transport pump. So you could say, so your brain, even though it weighs like two or three pounds, is going to be using 20 or 25 percent of your resources. 40% um, of the energy used by your brain today is going to be powering this pump. That's how significant it is to maintain this resting memory potential because a nerve can't work unless it's like a coiled spring, unless it has this energy stored in it. And that negative 70 millivolts resting potential is that stored energy. All right, so what electrolyte causes depolarization, repolarization slash hyperpolarization, and then uh, neurotransmitter released? So 
Um, depolarization would be when sodium rushes into a neuron and that, so sodium has a positive charge, so that negative 70 millivolts becomes negative 60, 50, 40, 30, zero, you know, up to zero, and then plus 20, plus 30. So what, ha what happens there is, um, so basically sodium channels open, sodium rushes into a nerve, and that's how it fires, that's how it depolarizes. But then when we get to positive 30 millivolts, sodium channels slam shut and potassium channels pop open. So now potassium rushing out of a nerve is what repolarizes it. It goes from positive 30, 20, 10, 0, and then down the negatives. But here's the key difference. Whereas the sodium channels, they slammed shut at positive 30 millivolts, so it didn't keep going higher. At negative 70 millivolts, the potassium channels slowly close, and that's a key difference. So by the time the potassium, so imagine like a castle where the, the gate's slowly closing, but people are sneaking back in still. So by the time the potassium channels absolutely close, the voltage has dropped down to like negative 100. So now this nerve is hyperpolarized. There is a period of time where uh, the nerve has not returned back to its resting member potential of negative 70 millivolts. Reason that's important is that creates this period of time where this nerve can't work. It's called the absolute refractory period. Basically, a nerve can't fire while it's already firing or right after recovering from firing. And then there's the relative refractory period where you could force this nerve to fire, depolarize, but it would take a much stronger stimulus than normal. So that's, and the reason that's so important is because that means your nerves are always going to fire in one direction. As a chunk of nerve is firing, the chunk right behind it can't. If not, imagine like your nervous signals uh, turning around and going the wrong direction. So that would be a very bad thing. You don't, you don't need to sense your motor commands and you don't need to, uh, you don't need uh, signals that are coming partway to your brain to turn around. So that's why this hyperpolarization is so important. So sodium, just think real big picture, sodium turns nerves on, potassium turns nerves off. Uh, for neurotransmitter release, that's, that's calcium. So at the end of the nerves, the, the signal that's being sent by sodium is going to trigger the release of calcium, and calcium is actually what's going to cause neurotransmitters to be released uh, through their, in their vesicles. So sodium turns nerves on, potassium turns them off, calcium leads to the release of neurotransmitters. Okay, what is the all or none principle as it relates to neurons? So just like with muscles, um, a, nerve, a nerve is either firing or it's not. So there's no like partial firing of a nerve. I think, I think a gun is a great example. Like it takes a lot, I, I've only fired a gun once, but it took a lot more pressure on the trigger than I imagined it would. But once I pull the trigger, that bullet's going to fire. Like if I, if I, if I pull the trigger too lightly to fire it, nothing's going to happen. There's no partial firing of a gun. Once I reach that, it's called, in, with the nerve, it'd be called a graded potential. Once, once I reach that graded potential where I've pulled the trigger, causing that sodium channels to fly open, that nerve is going to fire. There's no partial firing of a neuron. Just like with muscles, there's no partial contraction of a, of a single muscle fiber. So that's the all or none principle. And let's see, what neuron type is fastest and slowest? So you have your type A, B, and C fibers. Type A fiber, so the two key things are with a nerve when it comes to speed is are they myelinated or not? So if they're covered in that fatty insulation called myelin, they're gonna, they're gonna fire faster. And then size, so larger nerves are gonna fire the fa faster than smaller nerves. So that your type A nerves, the fastest nerves are gonna be large and they're gonna be covered in myelin. Your slowest nerves, the type C fibers, are going to be small and they're, gonna, they're not gonna be covered in myelin. So there's a reason this is significant. I call it the pain gate theory. So like why, when, 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 some, when we get hurt, if it hurt my elbow, like why do I rub it? Or why do things like biofreeze work where you're just, uh, so, or things like, um, you know, the different type of electrical, elect, like TENS units, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Why is stimulating the receptors on your skin, why does that help with pain? So why do we rub things? Why do we use things like menthol or biofreeze? Well, the reason for that is because those sensory nerves are going to fire faster than the pain fibers. So pain fibers are these kind of crude type C neurons with pretty crude receptors. So if I'm if I put biofreeze on my elbow, that I'm get I'm sending that cooling sensation to my brain so fast that and only so much information can reach your brain in a location at a time. So I'm feeling cool cool and feeling tingle and what I'm not feeling is pain. So I, I've had many patients where TENS units have changed their life, at least over short periods of time, where what they're feeling is this tingling sensation being sent by these nerve stimulators and now they put them inside of people instead of just being used on their surface. These signals are being sent to the brain and it's actually crowding out. So I always like, I like to say it's closing the pain gate. So you're feeling that. You want to feel anything else but pain. So that's why understanding these nerves is clinically significant as well. Okay, I hope that helped a lot. So get your learn on.